past two years have been very interesting. Since the beginning of 2018, we've witnessed some of this generation's greatest success stories and most abysmal failures. It's been a fucking roller coaster, but not a fun one like a Spongebob one. There have been controversies left and right. Crunch and unionization have joined the overall industry discussion in a way we've never seen. And amidst all this craziness, all of these exposés and horror stories, sometimes we lose focus on the games. And that's exactly what we're here to talk about today. Welcome to Charlie's Top 20 Games of 2018 and 2019, because I didn't make one of these last year and I still have funny footage of Red Dead I haven't used. Now, I might have gone a tad overboard it's with- It's a fucking hour long! Yeah, it, it, it's a little lengthy. Nobody watches these top yeah, 10! Yeah, I know. But by God, you are here for Charlie's thoughts on things and you are gonna get those thoughts today and you are gonna get them in bulk. In order to avoid wasting any more of your precious time, let's get this shit show on the road. <laughs> Online. This time around, we're starting our countdown off with two games. Because this list is already a year late, who fucking cares? I'm mashing my love for two EDF titles into slot number 20 because, let's face it, both of these titles make up a sum total of one real video game. Like, look at this. What the fuck is this? I paid $60 for this! And god damn it, I loved every second of it! But what I loved even more than the endearing jankiness of EDF5 was Earth Defense Force Iron Rain, a fresh entry into the series headed by an American developer this time around, an uncommon occurrence for the franchise. Somehow, the team over at Eux managed to successfully capture the aggressively Japanese flavor of EDF while giving it a much needed fresh coat of paint, one that brings the franchise that much closer to finally looking like a PS3 game. There's just something so lovable about the outward arcadey feel of this series. You're just here to shoot some bugs, and goddammit, you're gonna shoot some fucking bugs. None of that haughty narrative shit. Who needs characters when you've got a giant orgy of skyscraper-sized spiders to blow up? The infestation is here, and you're the only exterminator in town. Oh, right! In their games! I remember those! Look, I know. I'm not starting off with a lot of credibility here. Earth Defense Force and now Crackdown, I'm coming across like I have the taste of a 14 year old with way too much fun dip, but I gotta be honest with you. <laughs> Crackdown 3 isn't terrible. It's also directly up my alley, especially during a decade sorely lacking in big budget stupidity. Plus any game that lets me super jump automatically starts out at like a seven out of 10. That's, that's pretty much my favorite thing to do in a video game. C3 recalls a decade old era in game design that I'm quite fond of. It reminded me of the time I spent with ridiculous open world shoot 'em ups like The Saboteur, Saints Row 2 and 3, and of course the original Crackdown. The worst sin this game commits by the end of it all is being forgettable. But boy, does it commit hard to that sin. Crackdown 3 feels like the most intense experience I've ever had watching paint dry. This game is so startlingly bland that writing an entire in-depth bit about it just feels disingenuous. It doesn't feel suitable to the experience I'm covering, as what you're watching is essentially the video game equivalent of a book filled with nothing but placeholder text. Playing an extended session of Crackdown 3 starts to feel like you're reading lorem ipsum, and it gets really surreal. Ulamco laboris nisi, ut aliquip ex ia komodo kesquat. Dollar said emit, said du es mod temper incidentant consectator ad bless elit. <laughs> <laughs> I do think it's strange how the game looks like a fucking Agents of Mayhem sequel with the animated cutscenes and the weird imagined future tech when the original game was more based around grounded gangsters with a smattering of light sci-fi here and there. It felt so cool to play as an agent in the original Crackdown because the agency was the only central sci-fi element of the experience. You the player were the one and only agent, unless you played in co-op, and everybody else paled in comparison. This time around though, you're fighting robots and supervillains, it all feels a bit sanitized. That especially comes through in the director, a character who originally felt a little, I don't know, unhinged, psychotic. Thank you. <laughs> like he always gleefully encouraged the violent murder of these criminals, but this time around, his delivery comes across a lot softer, more like a 90s cartoon narrator. Again, Agents of Mayhem style. I don't know what I'm getting at here, it doesn't really matter, point is, Crackdown 3 is fine. Despite the fact that it plays like a tech demo for 12 year old tech, I found a fair bit of fun in its blunt stupidity. If you're feeling hungry for a greasy bowl of microwave popcorn in video game form, Crackdown 3 
is the place to be. It's not nutritious or filling, but goddamn, it is comforting. And I think we all deserve a little bit of that these days. You may be wondering how Far Cry 5 ended up on my top 20 in a batch of years that included far more compelling releases like Pathologic 2, Outer Worlds, or Yakuza 15, even though I secretly don't give a fuck about those games. Well, my friend, that's because spot number 19 actually goes to Far Cry 5's Map Editor. Yes, this game in and of itself can fuck right off. Sure, the latest Far Cry game controls great, looks fine, and plays entirely like a video game, but besides that, there's not much left to say. This cable access ass preacher is a real dud of a villain. Honestly, I would have preferred a real cable access preacher as a villain. That would have been much more entertaining. The devil is a motherfucking liar. So you know I ain't worried. Biatch. <laughs> bitch, I'm flowing straight from the survival scroll. <laughs> Cut that bitch off. And that ending. Oh. Oh. God. That ending is just one of the stupidest things I've seen in a hot minute. Despite all that, Far Cry 5 also came with the single best first person level editor ever to be included alongside a full console release. The variety of environments and scenarios you can create in which to murder people brings to mind a modern time splitters, which I already made a video about. Didn't age super well, honestly. And that video didn't age super well because sadly, the Far Cry arcade didn't age all that well. Ubisoft let a potentially fruitful additional gameplay mode die on the vine due to a lack of significant multiplayer support. People lost interest fast, and Ubisoft didn't seem to see fit to prevent that from happening, so the arcade's a bit of a mess these days. That being said, the marketplace is still filled with gold, as long as you're willing to seek it out and manually unearth it from a large pile of shitty, unfinished, surrealist, painting-ass looking maps that make up the large majority of selections. Some of my favorite arcade maps include Cry Cyber Next, The Looper Series, Mad Map, Simulation Theory, Solid Scorpions remake of Ground Zeroes, and Grandview Estates, to name a few. Be sure to check some of those out if you ever happen to be futzing around with Far Cry 5's immaculate editor. And hey, if you're playing on PS4, you can even try out some of my maps. No. I know you're supposed to play this game stealthily, like a sneaky master assassin, going around listening to conversations and picking up clues as to what Rube Goldberg machinations of death you can hack together using the level's available parts, but I, on the other hand, played this game like an Al-Qaeda audition. That's it. That's the only joke I wrote for this bit. Okay, okay, fuck it, I'll talk about Hitman for a sec. Also, as I was writing this script, uh, my autocorrect adjusted the word Hitman to Herman, so I'm gonna be calling this guy Herman from now on. You play as Herman the Hitman, a human being with a head so reflective that he's a one good polish away from breaking a pool game. For the record, I generally prefer my stealth to be more active as opposed to reactive, and Hitman tends to fall into the latter category, so it's never been my go-to franchise when it comes to stealth games. With that in mind, I had a fucking blast with this game, mostly because I played it entirely wrong, which speaks to the flexible and surprisingly forgiving nature of Hitman 2. I fought the game, but the game let me fight. You can tackle your objectives using countless methods, whether that involves carefully considered surgical strikes or running around like a chicken with his head cut off and a gun stable to its wing. Every once in a while, I would indulge in one of Hitman's prefabricated mission pathways, but honestly, that experience paled in comparison to just picking up a fire axe and going Michael Myers on motherfuckers. At one point, you gotta take out some cartel people, and yeah, you could spend 20 minutes tracking down leads and setting up some Looney Tunes ass bullshit, or, or, and hear me out, you could hop out his weed and shoot him 50 times in the chest. That's how you do it. That's my man Herman. The sun shines bright over the land. Shopkeepers shopkeep, gardeners garden the day away. It's a lovely day in the village, and you, are a terrible goose. Similar animals can be found all around the world, but the subject of today's documentary, this particular goose, is a dick. Every day he sees fit to meander through this idyllic pocket of simple English living with the singular goal 
of causing unimaginable chaos. This is all well deserved though, as our intrepid goose is merely exacting vengeance for the time he was held above a snare drum for 17 seconds. This innately thieving, mischievous, sneaky creature proves to be quite the goosence to this small town, as he often disrupts the day with heinous activities like stealing the toys of the local school children. These eyeless children spend their days chasing him down in sequences that often look straight out of a fucking Ari Aster movie, who coincidentally is currently slated to direct the feature film adaptation. Living life through the eyes and tippy-tabby feet of a vengeful goose is an experience like precious few out there, allowing you to live out your gooseiest fantasies and pull stealthy maneuvers that would make Solid Snake proud. Solid Goose. The only way this journey could possibly be improved upon is with a multiplayer sequel, which I will from this point on call Untitled Geese Game. Be sure to tune in next week on Animal Planet for our newest relevant documentary, Chocobos. What the fuck is a chocobo? Something about this game is just, I don't know, hilarious? Like that, right there, that execution. The first time I saw that, I cackled like a forest witch. Everything in Blasphemous is such a goddamn downer that the only possible reaction to this game besides depressive despair is unhinged hilarity. And I found much more solace and entertainment in the latter. And look, I don't wanna seem like I'm just dismissing this game's art style and tone as stupid or too intense for its own good. It absolutely nails the whole biblical suffering vibe it's going for. But again, everything is so exaggerated that it's hard not to find humor in it. It's just little things throughout the game, like the way Cone Guy rubs the healing items all over his fucking face like a lunatic, or or how excited and jaunty his animation is when climbing a ladder. Look at that, so peppy. Looks like he should be singing a John D. Seaman song on that bitch. The voice acting in particular is so far over the top that the top didn't even see that shit go by. It just flew directly into the sun. One must carry out the three humiliations to gain access to what they guard. And I got so into it that I kept like doing voiceover for the game myself when there wasn't any playing and, and that was the best. That really cemented the entire experience for me. I just ruined all the cutscenes by fucking around like, I am the penitent one, born from this pile of pious suffering for but one purpose. I remove thine cone and the cone filleth. I now don my <laughs> <laughs> I thought something would happen. Boy, don't I feel silly. Oh, 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 is this where I get my upgrades? Hell yeah, what the Give me word? that shit. Uh, take that shit back. All right. So, am I stronger or? Ah, oh, fuck. Ah, oh, fuck. Ah, oh, fuck. How oh, you like that shit? A ladder. Hi, 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 hi. Thank the miracle I finally found a place to get some shit for my sword. This is going to be great. I go oh, far coming through again. Shut up. Remnant from the ashes gives me conniptions. Not because it's so difficult, but because I have such mixed feelings on it. My love and my hate for Remnant fight each other at every turn. But I've already talked about that in another video for about six minutes, so if you'll indulge me for the next three minutes or so, I want to talk about why I don't like Darksiders 3. Over the past year, I've made several allusions to the fact that I don't like Darksiders 3 across multiple videos, so I feel like it's time to clear the air. To be clear, I love Darksiders 1 and 2. They're some of my absolute favorite 360 games. They're very clearly Zelda knockoffs with a healthy dose of God of War in there, but they did enough unique stuff to carve out their own identity, particularly in the second game. The loot system, the enhanced platforming, the dense upgrade trees, the blistering combat packed with probably too many enemies, these features all helped the Darksiders series work towards crafting its own non-copy-pasted Zelda game identity for itself. Darksiders 3 
is just Dark Souls, but with bad. Like, like here, here's a graph. If Darksiders 1 and 2 are like, let's say 50% Darksiders and 50% Zelda, 50% copied from another franchise wholesale and 50% unique and fresh. Darksiders 3 is like 20% Darksiders and 80% Dark Souls. The ratio of copied shit to inspired shit has become very skewed this entry. Here, here's a list of features from Dark Souls that transferred over into Darksiders 3. Features that were mostly not a part of the previous two entries. Let's pair a list with our graph. Sterile, ambient, and a Linear environments populated only by enemies and a few sparse NPCs and merchants. The first two games environments were much more open and packed with collectibles and side quests. Fighting groups of one to three enemies at once, max, and baiting other enemies out from larger groups to whittle the numbers down. The first two games combat did not work like this. Taking massive damage on a hit makes you feel like a punk. Death and war weren't punks! Enemies respawn after you die, and when you die, you respawn at the bonfire you most recently interacted with. I'm sure they're not called bonfires, but they're bonfires. You also lose all your souls on death. They're literally called souls! And you can go back to the location you died at in order to pick them up again. Your main currency is souls, which can be used to both buy items as well as upgrade both your character and weapons. The Dark Souls economy. You heal with a lengthy animation tied to a limited resource that refills when you die. A wordy comparison is unnecessary. You upgrade your weapons to plus one, plus two, plus three, etc. by giving souls to a blacksmith. The game is based around boss fights and if you die while getting to the boss, you'll have to fight all the previous enemies again or do a Dark Souls-ass boss run if you want to get back there easy. This is just a basic list. I'm sure I'm missing other important comparisons. The point I'm making here is that Darksiders 3 doesn't feel like those first two Darksiders games anymore. It feels like Dark Souls. It feels like a game ripped out of a wholly different series because it is! The franchise has traded its tried and true mechanical identity for an entirely different game's playstyle. And for what? What did the series gain out of this change? And I just know somebody's down in the comments right now typing, but, but all the horsemen are supposed to play differently. Darksiders 1 and 2 were totally different, and no. They fucking weren't. Darksiders 2 simply expanded upon what the first game did. Just because death has a few extra systems to work with and moves quicker doesn't mean they changed how the series worked. They just made a fucking video game sequel. The third Darksiders, at its core, just has the wrong idea. And I know as a random fan on the internet, I don't have any right to declare what any series should or shouldn't be, but I don't think the fans wanted this. We wanted Darksiders, not... Whatever this is. And like, come on guys, you have Remnant now. Let that be your Souls-like series and get Darksiders back to where it needs to be. I'm talking high scope, high octane action with a bunch of enemies and ginormous bosses. Sick ass finishers, extensive platforming that doesn't just feel like an afterthought. Abilities and gadgets out the wazoo. Metal ass environment design that isn't just a bunch of rusted out old buildings. A horse that we can fucking ride. Come on guys. Give me back my Darksiders, please! And this is all without even touching on the technical problems of Darksiders 3, the problems with its performance and core gameplay. This whole time I've been talking about Darksiders 3 in the context of Darksiders as a whole, but even judging the game purely on its own merits, I still think it's the weakest entry in the franchise. I don't know if they've patched this out yet, they probably have, but on release the game was filled with constant terrible loading screens that would stop the gameplay cold for like 10 seconds every five minutes, seemingly at completely random intervals. The other games had similar loading issues, but it was worse than ever this time around. On top of that, the combat just doesn't feel refined or balanced enough to correctly achieve that deeply satisfying Dark Souls challenge that they were so clearly shooting for. Enemy variety and attack patterns aren't all that impressive, the four main weapons, while cool, aren't all that exciting or creative, and the tracking of enemy attacks can get ridiculous, often making combat feel unfair. And you can throw all the get goods you want at me, but in the end, the difficulty of this third game isn't the problem, not at all. The problem is that it doesn't feel like a Darksiders game, and what it does feel like 
doesn't feel very good. Darksiders 3 doesn't do what it's trying to do very well, and that is as big a problem as it sounds, as evidenced by the fact that Gunfire patched in a mode post-release that makes the game play more like the first two. If Darksiders 3 ends up being a, a one-time detour down Soul Street, maybe I'll look back on it with more fondness in the coming years. Alternatively, if the next Darksiders game doubles down on what DS3 is offering, I don't think I'll be buying. Here we are. It's finally time to talk about Hideo Kojima's most recent opus, Death Stranding. You play as Chronic Back Problems, a man who's just bebopping across America in a journey to reconnect the country and save his... sister? Mother? Lover? Dr dream acquaintance? Who is this woman again? What is this story? Why should I care about any of these characters? This shit is just mumblecore Metal Gear. Haha! <laughs> but really, this game's a bit of a mess. Just like The Phantom Pain, nearly all of the interesting character stuff is relayed through log entries, which is Fucking groundbreaking, I think we can all agree. This time around though, you don't even have someone reading them out and doing some voice acting, so you just have to slog through these huge blocks of minuscule text with no paragraph indentations. I don't know whose idea that was. Did the apocalypse take the fucking tab key with it? Ah, oh, god, I feel like I'm at the fucking optometrist when I'm reading these things. One, or two. One, or two. And when we get to the actual cutscenes where we usually see Kojima thrive, we instead get the man at his most self-indulgent and heavy-handed yet. And you know I'm talking some serious shit because it's not like this dude was much of a light touch in the first place. Make no mistake, if this dialogue was any more stilted, it would be 15 feet in the air. But uh, I feel like we all knew that going in. If you expected anything less than that, you were either fooling yourself or you didn't know what the fuck you were getting into. I fell into the former category, personally. And I'm not defending the bullshit exposition dumps that this game and previous Kojima joints have been based around, mind you. I'm just pointing it out. This is what the guy does. This is how he's always written his stories and you can either take it or you can't. Personally, Kojima's special brand of obfuscated expository bullpucky is often sweet, sweet music to my ears. So I wasn't only anticipating it, I was ready to lap it up. And that I did, for, like, the first third of the game when it was good, and not bad, because, wow, this game gets bad sometimes. My mother never liked him. She made that pretty clear. But I didn't think she'd go as far as to lie. Seriously, this scene right here is one of the cringiest scenes I have seen in a modern video game. It's like the fucking Miami connection. It's just so embarrassing. Take me to him. I'm begging you. Yeah, let's... I'm ready to go. Let's give her all the lines. Is this girl... Am I really gonna have to carry this girl to her boyfriend, who I thought was her father for an extended period of time, because she acted like a fucking nine-year-old in the videos he showed me? How the... Oh my god. This bitch got in a sack. Death Stranding is full of strange shit like this, ranging from far out scenarios such as carrying a woman in a sack on your back to more subtle gameplay quirks like press square to cut umbilical cord. Huh. Haven't seen that before. And despite the fact that this game is one big mysterious, huh, I haven't seen that before, it's also, I'm sorry guys, it's boring as fuck. It's a repetitive, unrewarding slog, and maybe that's the point, but in my opinion the narrative is not compelling enough to make the journey worth that point. It's kinda like Outlast 2, by the end I just couldn't give a fuck. The game really lost me at the end there with a string of distinctly bad boss battles. And this final cutscene with Die Hardman, this shit had me laughing, it was so 
hammy and overacted, like, like props for the dude for putting it all out there, but the scenario of watching the President of the United States ball like a child while Norman Reedus awkwardly stands in a random hallway, like five minutes after this dude's inaugural speech just tickled me fucking pink. And he's just sitting there on his knees like, oh God, I can't, oh God, I'm such a master. And I was just fucking <laughs> laughing. Such a violent display of emotion after 30 hours of life exposition dumps was super jarring and awkward. Maybe it would have worked inside the heightened universe of Metal Gear with all its impassioned speeches, but here it just felt so embarrassing. I keep coming back to that word, embarrassing, and, and I'm using it because it does feel apt to me, but I also don't want to sound like I'm just here to shit all over everybody's hard work, which I am kind of doing, but I'm just here to give my opinion with a deliberately comedic slant. We're all about having fun here at Purposeless Rabbit Hole, so Mr. Kojima, I know you're watching. Don't take anything too personally. Clearly, love and passion and creativity was shoveled into this experience by the pound. And I do genuinely believe it's worth your time if you're into experiments within this medium, but overall, this was a disappointment for me, and that's why it's not cracking the top 10. I will say though, the game started off strong as hell. The terrorist attack sequence we saw in a trailer years back still holds up as one of, if not the single best sequence that Hideo Kojima has ever directed. The beginning of this story had me hooked. It got its claws in me, but its grip became weaker and weaker as the hours strolled on by. Beginning scan. Scanning bridges ID. Now that I'm done venting and getting my months late complaints out of my system, let's talk about why this game landed in my top 20 at all, because I doubt you'd think this was a best of list if this was the only thing you'd heard. I do have some good things to say about Death Stranding, surprisingly. Let's just list them off real quick, keep it simple. Some of the performances are pretty good. Mads Mikkelsen does a serviceable job with the minor role he's given, and the guy who plays Guillermo del Toro's face is very endearing. Norman Reedus is a plank of wood. Also, this scene, the one that initially feels like Guillermo del Toro is aggressively and sexually pinning Norman Reedus against the wall of a shower, uh, I... I get the feeling this was the first scene Kojima wrote, and the whole game is just him trying to find something to hang around this. Building constructs is a good time. Using what Death Stranding calls PCCs, you can throw down one of several constructs that serve a variety of gameplay functions, and I enjoyed whipping these bad boys out at every opportunity. You can create storage containers on the fly, you can build little bases to watch Sam make funny faces, and of course, you can craft zip lines when you're done having fun and just want it to end. I'm sorry, this is the positive part. Every once in a while, something fun happens. While the game's genuinely thrilling moments were few and far between, I did find myself getting hyped every once in a while during a mule chase or a really desperate BT encounter. And between these upticks in interest, I did find some solace in the game's ponderous nature. It's the little victories that you gotta savor. Making it up a small cliff without taking a tumble and dropping all your shit or calming down your weird tube baby after a particularly nasty ghost dodging sesh, leaving some likes on a helpful bridge, things like these are incy wincy little wins for your character. I did find myself enjoying Death Stranding's gameplay loop, when it wasn't throwing awkward bosses at me, or forcing me to listen to minutes on minutes of stupid, stupid dialogue, or dragging itself the fuck out like it did in the last half. When the mechanics started to get a bit too repetitive and laborious to feasibly supply what us media connoisseurs call entertainment. And, uh, I guess that's it. And then came the next explosion. An explosion. That will be our explosion. One last note. Why does Norman Reedus have a tiny hamster tongue? Over the course of the last decade, survival has become a hugely prevalent genre, particularly within the indie scene. We've gotten countless variations on the idea, ranging from surviving the zombie apocalypse, to surviving a Tim Burton movie, to surviving some full-on Cobble Hanacost shit. Cannibal Holocaust shit. But my favorite twist on the concept came to consoles in 2018 when I survived the salty seas of Subnautica. Subnautica is basically the best version of this type of game I've ever played. Unlike a lot of major survival games, Subnautica's underwater world is handcrafted as opposed to randomly generated, a choice that helps the numerous alien biomes you'll be uncovering feel connected and real. 
The handcrafted nature of Subnautica's world also creates an incredible sense of pace from beginning to end, expanding from your humble beginnings in a claustrophobic sea pod to eventually setting up shop in some Sea Lab 2020 shit is a crazy satisfying and shockingly well-balanced experience throughout. You're always finding new gadgets to craft, caverns to explore, and giant fish to scream at. Alongside the immaculate exploration of Subnautica, you have the survival elements, but hey, if you feel like food and thirst and all that shit is too much to handle, Subnautica offers a variety of different gameplay modes that help suit the mechanics to your wants, your needs. If you're into survival games and you somehow haven't given Subnautica a shot yet, you are really missing out. This game is 100% worth your money. Uh, as long as you can handle the occasional- <laughs> I'm a shield for some goddamn Dragon Ball, guys. Fighters is an undeniably badass get- <clears throat> Arc System's first shot at handling one of anime's most iconic- Oh? Let's try this again. You can play as a team of your favorite- Okay! Before I shield for this particular Dragon Ball game, let's briefly talk about how it was completely fucked for like eight months after release. I have a video up on the channel called The Dragon Ball Fighters Experience. Here, let me give you a brief taste of my first half a year with Fighters real quick. It was a goddamn disaster. For months on end, this game couldn't hold a connection for shit. I got more dropped matches in my first year with fighters than I got matches with a winner. I saw people complaining about this online for a long time. It wasn't just me encountering these issues, and yet at this point, no one seems to want to talk about how Arxis sold a game and continued to pump out pay DLC for a game that most players could hardly fucking play. It is a bucket of horse shit, and I for sure won't be buying this game's inevitable sequel on release now that I know it's made by the same company who developed a game where more than half of the roster was relegated to pricey, downloadable crap. <sighs> With that out of the way, Fighters is a fine fighter. Picking up this game is easy as peasy pie, as its base mechanics are perfectly suited for both casual play and blazingly fast ranked matches thanks to the game's flexible auto combo system. And of course, the roster is pretty great. It's got an eyeball-pleasing and visually faithful art style, the soundtrack is dope and filled with jazzy Japanese goodness, and juke, I don't like how this game is based around three-on-three -three fights. Dragon Ball as a series has never really been based around group fights. The story almost always goes out of its way to isolate two characters for a mano a mano fight to the finish, so playing a Dragon Ball fighting game based heavily around other characters popping in and out just feels weird, given the source material. Sure, you have certain sequences scattered across the various arcs, like the Cybermen, or the Baby Cells, or the very end of the Tournament of Power, where multiple characters do have to fight all at once, but those situations are rarely the focus of any given showdown. Nearly all of the best Dragon Ball moments involve one-on-one -on -one fighting. That's why nearly every fucking game based around this franchise has been exactly that. Nothing wrong with trying something new, but the three-on-three -three core of the game doesn't feel all that appropriate for the subject matter. And I also must admit, I'm generally biased against these types of fighting games, they've never been my thing. Regardless, at the end of the day, Dragon Ball Fighters is fun. It's not the greatest fighting game I've ever played, hell, it's not even the greatest Dragon Ball fighting game I've ever played, but if you're invested in the franchise and haven't tried this one out yet, it's worth a shot. Especially now that you can get it cheap, which is what Arxis deserves. <laughs> Raditz. Master Roshi. Okay, we don't have fucking time for these slow-ass numbers. Number seven, this fucking crazy guy. Number six, this fucking crazy guy, but with a goopy arm. Number five, Harry Red Chess Goku. Number four, Harry Red Chess Vegeta. Number three, Imperfect Cell with his big old dick. Number two, the cool boo, evil and tall. Number one, Harry Red Chess... Did I already say that one? Fuck, 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 it's probably my least favorite Miyazaki game, but it's still like an 8 out of 10 because the team over at From Software are fucking masters of their craft, as everybody knows. They could make a game about floating around being a fucking fairy, and it would be amazing. Wait, did they do that? Oh yeah, yeah, they did. And then everybody responded, and it was with Where's Wario? 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 Where
<laughs> no, that is entirely hyperbolic. The gameplay here is rock solid, but I just preferred the more varied gameplay styles that were allowed in From's previous games. The RPG elements are sorely missed here. And, and I know, I don't want to turn this into a Souls comparison fest like I did 30 minutes ago. Sekiro is its own action game with its own rules, but I, I just never really took to those rules. You have to play Sekiro one way, and if you don't like that one way, if you don't like timing out your boss battles with a metronome and playing this shit like Katana Hero, then you are shit out of luck. I did eventually accept this, and I did get into the game's showdowns. There were absolutely some satisfying moments and crazy ass boss battles to be had, but by the end... In the moment, I really enjoyed the game, but looking back, the whole thing is a big old blur, which I think has something to do with the inevitable monotony of the deliberately stripped down and repetitive combat system. To talk some non-shit, I would like to say I really enjoyed the one -armed. wolf as a protagonist. The more traditional narrative structure of the game failed to grab me, but Sekiro himself shines as a constant beacon of a badassery throughout. I love how this game is this twitch-based, hyper-reactive dance of death, and yet you play as a protagonist who just sounds really baked all the time. I have come for you, my lord. Yes. As a matter of fact, the game is full of fun characters, the type of elusive, chuckling basket cases that Miyazaki's known for. I'm beginning to think he is one of these guys. Like, if you go up to him in the office and ask a question about game design, he just responds with a... Oh, we will see. Fun fact, I was actually skimming through the wiki and I noticed that apparently the Pot Noble uh, was the one NPC that Miyazaki personally worked on. Which... Listen, I want to become a cop. Yeah, that, that makes sense. By all marks, Sekiro's a great game. It didn't cradle my balls the way other Miyazaki joints did, but the batting average had to dip at some point, and overall, it's a visceral slice em up that can go toe to toe with just about any modern action game. Besides number six on the list, see you there! Yeah. I had never played a Metro game before this third entry. For a variety of reasons, I was never all that interested in the series, so you can imagine my surprise when Exodus became one of my favorite experiences of 2019. It very well could have been my favorite game of the year if it could just not suck for five minutes. I was just trying to climb a ledge. This game's got hella jank in its bones. Metro. Janky bones. Feels like it's being held together with scotch tape and shoelaces. Let's get the obvious cons out of the way real quick. The production values here are kind of rough because this game was made in a freezing Russian basement where everybody was sad and that shows in the sound mixing with the dialogue here. It is very hard to listen to sometimes. Every time a character speaks, it's a coin toss as to whether or not they're gonna sound like they're either shouting in your ear or whispering from halfway across the fucking globe. Hell, the sound mixing in general here is all over the place. Sometimes it's rich and mesmerizing and sometimes it sounds like our team's walking around with six extra pairs of feet. The environment is often a pain to maneuver through due to the sluggish controls and haphazard collision, the AI is shoddy, and the karma system based on your in-game decisions is very ill-defined and kind of backwards. It just feels strange that the bad ending for two characters is them going off to fight for a cause they believe in. Now despite all of that shit, and make no mistake, some of it is shit, I got a lot out of Metro Exodus. The game is divided up between a series of linear levels and more open levels, and there's really only two big open world chunks in the game, but I had more fun exploring those two levels than I did walking across the entire continental United States. The detail in this game, both artistically and mechanically, really comes to fruition in these later levels. It's not dishonored, but the simple ability to come at a situation from multiple directions adds a degree of strategy that really boosts immersion. And there, I finally said it. Immersion is what Metro Exodus is all about, and I gotta say, does it quite well. 
A specific moment really stuck with me. I remember I was driving through the dried up desert that once was the Caspian Sea and I was cut off by a gang of raiders who showed up out of fucking nowhere. Instinctually, I slammed reverse and flew back down the road probably like 200 feet from where these guys were. At this point, guns are going off and I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but you're very fleshy in these games. So I dipped out of my exposed position in the car and fled to a canyon wall for cover and then a goddamn sandstorm kicked in. Great, this, uh, okay. I'm, I'm popping off desperate shots, which is something I could have phrased better, and some of these dudes are going down, but I didn't get a count of how many there were initially, so I'm not sure what I'm up against in terms of numbers. Eventually, I get back to the car, and Jesus Christ, they are advancing very quickly. Blood pressure is rising. I'm taking some hits, but eventually I line up that one final shot. That's... Immersion, son. In that one sequence, you can see examples of multiple elements of Metro, small elements that collectively coalesce to make this game work. Like its bare bones HUD, its realistic movement, its seamless animations, the way it builds tension through limited and meaningful resources. Everything in this game, its HUD, its weapon management systems, its menus, its maps, everything is built from the ground up to make you feel like you are here, in this situation. What the fuck are you gonna do about it? If 4A can simultaneously iron out the bugs and expand the scope to increase a few more open world levels next time around, I could easily see a fourth Metro game landing in my top three of whatever year it happens to launch in. What do you get when you combine action, romance, martial arts, comedy, dancing, sports simulation, and a knockoff Mad Max protagonist with the proportions of a Rob Liefeld drawing? Why you get Fist of the North Star Lost Paradise, apparently. A game about everything. You want to explode the heads of fiendish marauders with stylish flair? Lost Paradise is your game. You want to play America's favorite pastime using a giant piece of scrap metal as your bat and lecherous wastelanders as your balls? Fist's got you covered. You want to heal the sick and the lame with the power of dance? No problem, bitch, the game's $20! I gotta be honest, I didn't know shit about Fist of the North Star before I started this game. At that time, my knowledge of the series was entirely drawn from a series of YouTube clips and one episode of Two Best Friends Play from, like, 2011. You are already dead. Oh my, you're already a fucking shitty game! Unbeknownst to me though, our stoic protagonist Kenshiro comes equipped with the healing powers of Jesus Christ! Except instead of just curing your sickness, like a pussy, Kenshiro literally attacks the weakness out of your body with his mighty fingers. Oh, those are some mighty fingers. As I callously mentioned earlier, I've never really gotten into the Yakuza games, but as you might be able to tell by this point, Lost Paradise is basically just Yakuza with a somehow even crazier skin slapped on. The Yakuza games always had my curiosity, but Lost Paradise got my attention. The variety of gameplay here is pretty solid, especially if you can get the game at a discount. And all that variety is backed up with visceral and batshit insane combat. If you blow up a dude's head just right, the word shit Balls will appear in the air next to him. And then you can grab that word and beat more people to death with shit balls. I needn't say more. Although I am gonna say a little bit more because if I cut it off here, you might surmise that this is the greatest game ever made. And I don't want to leave you with the wrong impression here because Lost Paradise is far from perfect. The upgrade tree is a little too expansive and cumbersome to the point where a good majority of upgrades don't make any noticeable difference to gameplay, there's a weird loot system that feels utterly pointless and unrewarding, and the game really needs some more voice acting. Almost nobody talks outside of very specific cutscenes. Really makes it obvious that the game had the budget of like a dozen Subway sandwiches. There are a lot of flaws here that take away from what could have been top five material, and I, I'm sorry, I'm distracted by what's happening on screen here. You can tend to bar in this game. Okay, just add that to the list of a thousand different other, okay, what's going on here? Mix, 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 You are already drunk. Forget what I said. Game of the year. Coming in at number 7 is God of War, or as many pronounced it, Game of Year. This thing has been receiving non-stop sloppy toppy since the day it released, and while this particular boy doesn't entirely agree with that line of thinking, I can't fault anyone for feeling that way, because this game is fucking good. 
This isn't fucking God of War. I'm sorry, it's just not. Who was asking for this? Who wanted God of War to be turned into a sluggish, over-the-shoulder hack and son? Who wanted the Blades of Chaos to be replaced with this dinky little boomerang axe? Someone serve up the crow. Cause it's dinner time. <laughs> Yes, I did not have high expectations going into this game, it's true. And while I do have some genuine problems with God of War, there's some pacing issues and the combat isn't nearly as engaging as it once was, it's still a pretty fucking spicy affair overall. The hits feel weighty as hell, the relationship between Kratos and Atreus has some dizzying dramatic high points, and the way the game slowly unveils its connections to the original trilogy is incredible, and leads to my absolute favorite gaming moment in the past two years. You sit with Kratos on this rickety little boat for minutes on end, building up to the big reveal, and about 60 seconds into this lazy river ride, something happens. I was losing my fucking mind. By the end of this sequence, real ass tears had been brought to my eyes because you just know that thousands of man hours and blood and sweat was poured into making this moment as perfect as possible. And it was all to help me realize that the Kratos I know and love is still in there. And he's still mad as fuck. Getting my hands back on these blades after not having felt their steely touch in eight long years was rapturous. Words truly cannot express the sublime joy I felt in that moment. But it wasn't just the Blades of Chaos that brought their A-game. For the first time in pretty much the entire series, Kratos gets a second weapon that A. doesn't suck, and B. isn't just a slight variation on the theme of Blades on Chains. Look. I love blades attached to chains as much as the next guy, but the third game did like three different versions of that concept. It, it got way excessive near the end there. You can also dress up Kratos like an armadillo, which is a thing. Not a fan of armor sets and stats in this series, personally. This game does tend to make me like stuff that I don't usually enjoy, though. I'm, I'm not usually the biggest fan of these Sony exclusives that tend to fall into the genre of third-person serious. It takes some real good writing and characters to make me pay attention to this many cutscenes, but I sat attentively through every single one, even when I thought some of them were kind of stupid. Hell, I hate time trials. That shit was overplayed two decades ago, and yet... I fucks with this game's time trials. All in all, God of War was a real charming surprise for me. I did not anticipate enjoying it the way I did, but by the end, by the time Atreus was shooting his fucking arrows while flying through the goddamn sky, I was here for it. 100%. I'm really excited to see what this new iteration of an aughts classic has to offer in the future. There are still so many exciting ways this series can grow, particularly in terms of the combat. So. Uh, go check out Joseph Anderson's three-hour monster of a video for further elaboration on that, because I don't got that much time on my hands. I'm back in this bitch! No other game in the past two years has allowed me to rev up a sword and use it in tandem with my laser-blasting robot arm to eviscerate floppy stump having multi mouth goat men. So DMC5 is already starting off strong. I don't think I have to tell you that this is one of the slickest, smoothest, and most intricate action extremaganzas ever made because I feel like you can just see that in the gameplay I'm showing. Which is not mine, by the way, I am not that good at this game. No, I'm actually using the Gaming Brit Show's footage here because, honestly, a big part of my hype for this game was based around waiting for his reaction analysis video review thing. Which, incidentally, led me to his community page, which led me to a link to his Instagram page, and boy, Look at this thick slab of man right here. Did you know that the Gaming Brit Show is a dime? Look at those delts, son! Oh my lord, TGBS Senpai, take me away! Rename this shit to the Gaming Beefcake Show, whoo! What was I talking about? DMC5. This game has everything going for it. On top of the deeply layered combat, it's got great characters, a compelling narrative, a ball-blasting soundtrack, a great sense of humor, the smokinest waifu of the year, killer boss visuals, killer boss movesets, wonderful art design, crisp graphics, and jolly lines for days, DMC5 has it all. And that's to say nothing of the ending. I'm not gonna play it here, but the final line in DMC5 is one of the most hype fucking moments I've ever seen. I fucking stood up and pumped my fist. I can only imagine how that ending felt for people who had grown up with the series and the ongoing Dante-Virgil conflict. 
For me, this was the first DMC I got to experience on release next to this Voldemort-ass game who shall not be named, and I don't think I could have picked a better place to start. The only reason, the only reason this game isn't even higher on this list is because I didn't find a lot of replay value in it, but I'm not the kind of guy who replays hack and slashers over and over to get my combos down, so that's a given. If you're that kind of action gamer, you will never fucking stop playing this game. Spider-Man, Spider-Man, doesn't do what Webber Shadows can. Throw him off the fucking building! Ah! But it's still pretty good. It's a game that I play. Look out, here comes a spicy day. Upon reflection, this game isn't as close to perfection as I first thought it was, but it's still really good. I redact the 9 out of 10 for my initial review and replaced it with an ever solid 8 out of 10. I don't know, if this game was really a 9 out of 10 Spider-Man game, I'd probably still be playing it, but I'm not. The combat got a little old, after like 50 hours though, which makes sense. The swinging isn't layered enough to keep me slinging, and without the genuinely riveting story to make the open world feel like it's reacting to what's happening, New York doesn't feel alive or interactive enough. You mostly got a couple of mini games, some side quests, and a metric fuck ton of finger guns. I could easily talk about this game for another 45 minutes, but, uh... I've already done that. I will now spend the next 20 seconds showing you pictures I've taken in photo mode, because these have to go somewhere. Really though, Insomniac, please add custom suits to the next game, please! If SCP Containment Breach, Second Sight, and PsyOps had a big fucked up mind baby, I have a feeling it would end up looking a lot like this game. Awesome telekinesis powers? Check. An oppressive, eerie environment? Check. Nightmares lurking around every corner? To check Pepper in some self-aware humor on top of that classic Sam Lake charm and you've got Control. One of the most creative and weirdest games of the generation. Now I do want to say, I don't think Control got weird enough. I know that might seem strange to say based on what you're seeing on screen, but Control never goes all the way with its concept in my eyes. There are a couple of unexpected boss fights in there, but I wanted a bit more of that stuff, the stuff nestled in the side quests, which is where the game treads the closest to outright horror. Control is certainly eerie and even dips its toe into creepy, but it's never scary, and that kind of disappointed me. The opening hours had me real spooked, but as the game went on, things started to seem less and less surprising, more mundane, which works in the context of the character you play as. Jesse is a effectively going through orientation day throughout the entire game, so it makes sense that you'd feel suited for the job by the end of it all. But the oldest house is an environment so perfectly suited for pure horror that I couldn't help but feel a little deflated by the lack of deliberately frightening moments. Although I suppose it's hard to make anything frightening when you're equipped with Jesse Faden's power set, which is one of the many highlights of the game. It feels so good to launch, levitate, and dash your way through the oldest house that I'm still booting this shit up a year later. There's nothing left to do, I've already beaten everything, I just love hurling filing cabinets at my staff. Speaking of said staff, Control's ensemble of employees is very memorable, and happens to include my best loved game character of the last two years. Dr. Darling, not that one, the other one. Dr. Casper Darling is the awkward and extremely entertaining head of research at the Federal Bureau of Control. He's the resident mad scientist, basically. Despite what you may have heard, HRAs are not monitoring devices. We're not tracking your movements or listening to your conversations while you're wearing them. We do that regardless whether or not you're wearing an HRA. The way he's played by Matthew Perotta in live action is captivating. Where most mad scientists in media put the emphasis on MAD in all caps, Control instead puts the emphasis on scientist. Dr. Casper Darling, to me, seems like he could have been a normal guy if he didn't pursue this path in his life, but he's just become too entrenched in his research. This shit he's discovered is important. He realizes the gravity of the work he's doing and is willing to go all the way for it. And while that inevitably results in disaster, it's also 
kind of hard not to admire the man's dedication and intelligence. I'm just saying. Plus, he's just fucking adorable. And he's also got a great singing voice, but if you haven't played the game, I'm just gonna let you wonder about that. That's something you have to experience for yourself. In fact, I'm just gonna stop talking and showing footage and spoiling shit because my previous statement applies to this whole game. You just gotta see it for yourself. And then you too can claim... Yeah, I'm Jesse fucking Faden. She says this line after participating in a guided imagery therapy session narrated by fucking Hideo Kojima. The soda you kill a man for. Hurry, run! Soda! You... You should play Control, guys! Man, oh man. I did not expect to love this game as much as I did. I was never a fan of the first Red Dead, honestly. I played it and I beat it, but that's mostly because I was like 15 at the time, I didn't have shit else to do. The world of RDR1 always felt a little lifeless to me. I wasn't really feeling the main character and the admittedly satisfying gunplay didn't fill the void that the lack of truly interesting missions created across the tens and tens of hours the game required of you. Red Dead Redemption 2 fixes all of the issues I just mentioned and adds about a thousand more awesome things to the equation. And what you're left with is one of the most polished and affecting open world games ever made. Rockstar promised an evolution of the open world formula and by god they did not disappoint. There's something very special about the fact that you don't explicitly interact with the open world through aggression or violence. Sure that's still a bit of a factor but if you want to go around hammering back shots and starting up awkward conversations with one-armed civil war vets you can. And that's amazing because all you could really do in the first Red Dead is walk up to somebody and shoot them in the fucking face. Unless of course they were you know pre-established quest related NPCs. So many Many of my favorite gaming moments of 2018 came from this game and started because Arthur Morgan just said something to someone, and that is so cool. What's your problem? You're gonna die here, you bastard! Guess what's also cool? Arthur fucking Morgan himself, the protagonist of Red Dead 2, who has quickly become one of my favorite game protagonists in forever. And of course, we can't forget his horse, Morgan. The Morgan Horse. Yes, I acquired a Morgan Horse and I named him Morgan. He's Morgan's Horse, Morgan the Morgan Horse, and he was my best friend for 60 fucking hours. And then he died. And I was so sad. Me and this horse shared so many memories together, like that time we rammed into a tree, or that time we rammed into a fence, or that time we ran into a sign. Oh, but how Morgan's Horse, the Morgan Horse Morgan, loved those guilt-laden post-collision sugar cubes. Let me tell you, he loved them so... God damn it, Morgan, I miss you every day. I actually loaded up my Act 3 save file again recently, and when I laid eyes on my main man Morgan Morgan's Morgan, it was like seeing an old friend. I'm just gonna let this clip play out for you guys right here, because it was a genuinely touching moment that really stuck with me, and I think it'll stick with me for a long time. Okay there, boy. But then I fast traveled and hit a loading screen and this accident prone horse was just sitting on the tracks. Morgan, Morgan, move out of the way. Mor- You need to- OH GOD, MORGAN, NO! Now sure, this game isn't perfect, but what game is besides Bloodborne? Red Dead has some issues with some clunky controls, some unnecessarily confusing UI, some classic rock star railroading, and some in-game choices that feel false and inconsequential by the time everything wraps up. But there's so much good shit between those brief low points that it's really hard to consider any facet of this game bad. Sure, there is some mediocre buried in there, but there's so much detail, so much love built into this grand epic tale that it's just really hard not to enjoy. The overarching story, the individual scenes, the characters, it's all some of the most memorable shit in the medium. Charles, my boy Charles, my boy Lenny! Hell, even Micah, the cocksucking peanut fucker, is easily one of the most conniving, effective, and effortlessly hateable villains of the decade. Man. It must suck to be named Micah in 2019. True story, actually. Uh, I worked with a guy named Micah in 2019, back when I was employed at a local movie theater, and uh, once me and a bunch of co-workers all collectively finished the game, we all ganged up on him in the kitchen and beat the shit out of him. Also, 100-hour work weeks? 
are bad for people. I know we're all having fun here, I don't want to bring down the vibe, but, but please cut that shit out. Number two on our list goes to a game that everybody played and everybody enjoyed. That's right, it's Resident Evil 2 Remake. I cannot remember a AAA horror game this good since fucking Dead Space. Resident Evil 2 is tighter than Mr. X's banana hammock. From front to back, this is one of the most polished and engaging horror games of the decade. This shit made my balls jump into my chest, and then my heart jumped out of my chest, and my, my balls just went with it. I seriously cannot remember the last game that genuinely frightened me like Resident Evil 2. Maybe Alien Isolation, but that was like six years ago. I'm starved for this shit. After being hungry for horror for so long, Resident Evil 2 tasted like a fucking five-star steak dinner. It's so nice to see normal zombies be scary again, but they're also still stupid and shambly as fuck. It's a perfect balance. The zombies here are so well executed. The enormity of, of their flat brain, the enormity of their stupidity is just overwhelming. And of course, we can't forget that... Mr. X is so fucking amazing, guys. He's so fucking great. I don't even have words. I'm at a loss. This game has rendered me speechless in the wake of its awesomeness. And the story. Wow, I kind of forgot I could care about the characters in these games. As Resident Evil started to focus more and more on spectacle after the third game, I feel like the series lost focus on giving us relatable or even interesting protagonists. Sure, nobody can deny that RE4 Leon is fucking amazing, but, but he's Captain Action Man there. He's not at all the cherub-faced rookie we see here. For the first time in a long while, I felt myself noticeably empathizing with the people in these situations on a very human level. And sure, some of that has to do with the top-notch facial animation and character models, but it also has to do with RE2's very relatable script and realistically portrayed characters. And of course it's all backed up with memorable and convincing performances across the board. Resident Evil 2 is fucking great. Why haven't you bought that shit yet? You're fucking up! This is it. The number one of both 2018 and 2019. As I mentioned in the intro, within the past two years, we've received some of the most advanced and impactful games of the decade to round out the eighth generation of consoles. We've hit on most of the greats so far, so what could possibly be left? <laughs> Let's get this out of the way, folks. You know what it is. I know what it is. The best game of 2018 and 2019 is Raid Shadow Legends, a game that I don't think people have really been talking about enough on this site. This is the most immersive, RPG experience you'll find on a phone anywhere. Forget everything you know about mobile games, cause Raid's gonna change it all. The game has genuinely some of the best graphics I've seen in a mobile game, combined with an engrossing story, these crazy boss battles, and over 400 champions to collect and customize. In fact, it's so popular that it's had over 15 million downloads in the last six months alone. I'm just fucking with y'all. It's Dead Cells, baby! This game came out in 2017. What? Well, it came out on PS4 in 2018. Fuck y'all! Yes, Dead Cells has eaten up more of my time than any other game in these last two years, and I can say that with absolute certainty. Funny little thing, uh, that fake raid promo I did a moment ago was made up entirely of other YouTubers' sentences, which is a great segue into this game as you probably know it because plagiarism. I, along with tens of thousands of other gamers, were introduced to Dead Cells after Philip M... Philip M... Philip Mucus, many gamers, were introduced to Dead Cells after Flem Mucus's plagiarism scandal, revolving around his 7th grade copycat job of a Dead Cells review by YouTuber Boomstick Gaming, who I am still subbed to. I haven't watched his videos in a year, but I am still subbed. I'm, I'm sure they're great. So yeah, someone tattled on Flem and simply through the internet collectively elbow dropping the fuck out of this dude for like a month straight, Dead Cells became pretty big in the conversation for a while there. And you know, thank God for this Sims preset looking motherfucker because in all honesty, I don't know if I ever would have touched this masterpiece if it wasn't for that controversy. No reason in particular, I'm not much of an indie guy in general so I probably just would have missed it, but I am so happy I didn't because this game 
It tickled my spots, guys. I'm a big ol' sucker for a good roguelike, and I can confidently say that Dead Cells is far and away the best roguelike I have ever played. Like all the best of the genre, the experience of playing Dead Cells changes over time as you peel back its many layers by getting just a little further into the game with each passing run. One week into Dead Cells, every time you start up the game, it's like, oh, what happened here? What's this lower? Oh, heck yeah, a new weapon! Oh, wow, you get skins? These teleporters do something? What the fuck is this? What the fuck is that? Oh, so magical, such exploration. Each run is a dense experience packed with learning opportunities and hidden secrets for those willing to venture off the beaten path what a complex experience. Six months later. Fuck you, 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 fuck you. This is the fucks. Alongside the pitch-perfect gameplay packed with a mind-boggling variety of weapons, shields, throwables, turrets, and superpowers, the characters and world of this game also really won me over. The whimsical flippancy with which Dead Cells treats its decaying world is really endearing. Like so many games of this generation, it's clearly heavily influenced by Dark Souls. I, I mean, fuck, the title's one Freudian slip away from just being Dark Souls. And the story feels very similar to that of the Souls series, but with a slight tweak that in this this case, the player character just doesn't give a shit. The prisoner's response to all the happenings around him whittle down to either a shrug or a middle finger, and it never stops being amazing. I could go on for hours about this game's level design and variety, its characters, its arsenal, its enemies, its bosses, its unlockables, its challenges, its deeply generous developers who've supplied numerous and often free DLC expansions packed with exciting new content, but I'm gonna cut myself off. Because honestly, I'd rather just be playing Dead Cells, like I have every goddamn day for a year and a half. Now if you'll pardon me, I'm going to continue trying to beat my current difficulty mode, which I have been stuck on for six months. I've done 300 runs. I'm still on 3 BC. I want to kill myself. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you.